Well, this is Ann Wright, and I'm a survivor of the, of the flotilla, the Gaza flotilla in May. And I want to thank everyone in Buffalo for being at this wonderful fundraiser for our U.S. ship to Gaza. Because we are challenging the, the Obama administration policies on Israel and Palestine. We're challenging the Israeli blockade policies that have, that have just strangled the people of Gaza over these last four years. The 1.5 million people that live in Gaza. So we're challenging the collective punishment of, of the people of Gaza. And through this raising funds for the U.S. ship to Gaza, uh, we will have an opportunity that we as U.S. citizens join other citizens of the world to say that citizens say no to these sieges and blockades and that we want our governments to be respectful of other people and not put these blockades and sieges on the people of Gaza. So thank you so very much for your fundraising for the U.S. ship and let's go. <laughs>
and there are the pictures actually of the percussion grenades being blown off into the Marmara. And she works for the Sydney Morning Herald. You can see those pictures online. Um, she was uh, hit with a stun gun by one of the soldiers. Here she was just sitting on the top of the bam, knocked all the way across. The women who were our line of defense, you know, we didn't go all that way just to say to anyone who tried to board us, oh, thank you very much for coming to visit us out in the middle of the Mediterranean. Here, come right on board. That wasn't what it was about. We were putting up nonviolent resistance. We put women out on the stern of our ship and along the railings. We figured we knew what would probably happen if men were put out there, that the testosterone factor would start moving in, and it would be something we might not want to do. So we put women out there who were yelling at the commandos, you have no right to come on our ship. Get away, get away, get off this ship. We're going, we're civilians, unarmed civilians, get away. So what do you think happened? Those women were run over by the commandos, ended up face down in all of the glass, uh, many of them hogtied, masks put over them, hoods put over them, taken to the, to the bow of the ship by the mask commandos. We never saw an Israeli face, never saw one. And it's very similar to what happens by U.S. forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. As they go on night raids, as they go on raids, they put masks over them so people can't identify them. And nobody wears name tags anymore. They don't want their names associated with this. We're dead. Uh, the nine people had a total of 35 bullets in their bodies. The young Turkish-American citizen, 19 years old, born here in Troy, New York, and lived the first two of years of his life here in Troy with his Turkish parents who were going to school here, and then returned to Turkey for the rest of his life. Uh, his body had five bullets in it, two to the head. Five other people had gunshots to their heads at close range. A total of 35 bullets in those bodies. It was a bloodbath, according to the women that were working in the first aid station, women that we talked with later as they came into the prison. They said they were ankle deep in blood. The Israeli military was in control within 20 minutes on the Marvin Marmara. They were in control within 20 seconds on our ship and anywhere from three to seven minutes on the rest of the ships. Uh, it was not a... Um, the, the, the Israeli military had choices. The Israeli government had choices, if indeed all they wanted to do was to stop the ships. The way our ship was actually stopped was that a larger ship came right in front of us and stopped. And the captain of our ship said, hmm, we're not here to ram other ships. So he pulled the power off and we were immediately boarded. It was, a, it was a terrible price to pay, nine people dead, 50 people wounded, but did it accomplish anything? Well, it certainly did. I mean, people like you all in countries all over the world were taking to the streets that were very, very disturbed about what they had seen and that were clamoring for action, clamoring for their countries to make statements about what was going on. And statements started pouring in from all over the world saying that the blockade was wrong, that the blockade needs to end. You had the Prime Minister of Great Britain saying it is time for this blockade to end. We didn't quite get the same statements out of our own U.S. government, our own administration at all. Um, what we've gotten from the Obama administration pretty much is don't embarrass the Israeli government. Uh, warnings to the Palestinians, don't embarrass the Israeli government during these times of the peace talks. Um, I immediately, when I came back, I went to our U.S. government to demand that they investigate the, the murder of an American citizen. Um, they have not done that. It took seven weeks before they responded to a letter that I took to Secretary of State Clinton with 80 questions I would like, just in case the U.S. government couldn't figure out to ask uh, in an investigation. I gave them 80 questions that I'd like to have the answers for. Seven weeks later, I still had not gotten uh, an answer, and that was after each week sending emails to my point of contact in the State Department. And it was finally when I wrote an article that appeared on Common Dreams and Truth Out and some of these uh, online journals that was entitled, 
Uh, now that the wedding's over, could Secretary of State Clinton please respond to the pleas of, of the 14 American citizens that were on board that flotilla? Only 14 Americans on board. But what happened, the outcry afterwards, was that the Israeli government was forced, was forced to modify its policies. They haven't broken the blockade. They haven't ended it by any means. The naval blockade is still in place. The, the restrictions on the movement of people are still in place. They have opened up the, the numbers of things that can come in. You know, previously to this, there were only 34 items that could come into Gaza. Only 34 items, things like spaghetti, spaghetti sauce, school tablets, things like that could not come into Gaza. They were prohibited. Now there's a list of only the prohibited island items, and that's about 100 of them that have, they feel primary military use. They supposedly have increased the volume of materials that are coming in, but it's nothing to compare to what's needed there. It's up to, rather than 10%, it may be up to 20% now. Um, what do you do when you, when you still have the blockade tr truly in place? Well, you go again. So we're having another, we're having another flotilla. And at the end of November or early December, we're going to have a second flotilla that may have up to 10 ships in it. Already we have a German Jewish ship that's already been purchased, already has its cargo, its passenger list already set. And you know, members of the Jewish faith have been some of the most outspoken people who are talking about what the state of Israel is doing. That that's not what they felt the state of Israel was created for at all. And it's been the voices of, of, of Jewish people who have been saying to the government of Israel, you've got to change these policies. These are actually jeopardizing the, the security of the state of Israel. Uh, we're going to be taking a ship from the United States to join one, hopefully from Canada, from Spain, from the Scandinavian countries, from the European coalition to end the siege, from Greece, from Turkey, from the Middle East, from Abu Dhabi, from Qatar, from Indonesia, from Malaysia. There will be a large flotilla. We need some help in getting our U.S. ship. We are fundraising for a U.S. ship right now. And in fact, let me just pass these things around. Could I ask you to pass these? How much does it cost to buy a ship? Oh, how many of you all have ever owned a ship? Oh, just a kayak. Well, if we had hundreds of kayaks, we're trying to raise $370,000 to buy a ship, to buy a ship in the Mediterranean and sail it for in, in, as a, from the United States of America. And, and guess what we're going to call it? We're going to call it the audacity of hope. <laughs> and we have we have t-shirts. We have t-shirts right in the administration space. That indeed we want our administration to be protecting us as we are going on a mission, a humanitarian mission, as we American citizens are challenging the policies of our own country as well as we are challenging the policies of Israel and Egypt. We're going to pass around a donation bucket. $370,000 is what we're trying to raise. That's what it's going to take to get a boat that will take 50 passengers. In the last eight weeks, we have fundraised and we have raised $248,000. Yeah! <laughs> people like you all. We have never had a huge donor that said, oh, here's, uh, you know, 10,000, 15, 20,000. That's not it at all. We are getting $5, $10, $15 from people like you. People like you who already have given to everything already, who don't have any extra money to spare, but you still have been so kind to cough it up.